HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. This program is made possible thanks to the generosity of our listeners. Show your support at heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. This week on Meet in 3, we're embracing the spooky spirit of Halloween, from zombies to witches. We're exploring the odd, the occult, and the taboo in the world of food. There are restaurants with no storefront shrunken down into hundreds of square feet versus thousands of square feet. No servers, no hosts, nobody taking your order. The rats in the sewers are now smelling, all of a sudden, fresh food molecules. And those rats were like, holy cow, follow that scent. Tune in to Meat and 3, HRN's weekly food news roundup, wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to The Grape Nation, your weekly wine journey. Our guest is David McMillan. We'll talk to David about Joe Beef, natural wine, David's transformation, and life during the pandemic. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Stay with us for The Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We bring wine to the people. Quebecois David McMillan is considered one of the most innovative, successful, and interesting restaurateurs in Canada. He, along with his partner, Fred Marin, are proprietors of multiple Montreal restaurants, including Joe Beef, Liverpool House, and wine bar Le Vin Papillon. Legendary for his bigger-than-life eating and drinking, David is now more inward, appreciating life with his daughters on his farm and changing the culture at his restaurants. David McMillan has been an early evangelist of natural wines, even though he spits now. He has published two radical cookbooks, Joe Beef Surviving the Apocalypse and The Art of Living According to Joe Beef, a cookbook of sorts. David McMillan, welcome to the Grape Nation. Thanks for having me on, Sam. Thank you for doing this. Now, due to COVID, we're doing a remote broadcast um, via Zencaster. Are you in Montreal? Are you on your farm? Tell me where you are. I'm in the apartment above Joe Beef. Okay, here you go. So you're very close to everything. All right, so to get started, I want people to get an idea of, you know, who you are and where you came from. And we'll get into the details during the show, but just give me a chronology. Spend a, a few minutes telling me about your journey in, in life and wine and food, you know, that got you to where you currently are, which is, you know, this Joe Beef empire. So the fast version really, you know, is uh, perhaps I was never diagnosed as tactile as a child. I struggled through school somewhat, uh, dropped out of uh, college, found a, a cool French restaurant with a cool French chef who kind of adopted me, uh, took me under his wing. And uh, 
you know, I found my path. Uh, all, for all of a sudden, there was something I was really good at. So one thing led to another. I went from working from that chef who believed that I should work in the city out for another chef. And then uh, they just emancipated me to Burgundy, where I spent uh, maybe three to four years working uh, different restaurants around the Cote d'Or from Dijon South. And uh, of course there, uh, I discovered quickly that food was important, but wine was more important. Uh, it's the crux of the, uh, the economy. And uh, it, 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 was, it was just expected, I guess, if you're to be a line cook or a chef, that your knowledge uh, immediately would, would, would tend towards wine. It was as important. You couldn't just be a chef. You needed to be a chef with wine knowledge. And uh, I learned that very, very early on. So I think that, that, you know, I insisted further after Burgundy when I got back to North America that wherever I work, the wine program uh, was equally as important to me perhaps as let's like, say the menu or the writing or the chef and eventually as I became a chef I, I demanded uh, wine list control in the restaurants that I worked in so it's always been uh, you know where the goat cheese comes from and where the beets come from and where the asparagus come from and the fish comes from for me the wine was always just as important which is like a flaw perhaps you know that I've mentioned several times with a lot of my peers you know, not to disrespect anybody, I know a lot of incredibly talented chefs that that have just like omitted that part of the the learning curve, right? Well, that was my, that was my next question. You know, when you get to Burgundy, I mean, wine is the culture. I mean, you know, if you're a line chef or you know the chef de cuisine, you know, wine is important. I, I mean, I guess you're alluding when you got back here. It, it just wasn't the same thing. And, and Montreal is even, you know, more French than, let's say, New York or L.A. Is that true, that the wine thing just wasn't important, you know, to it all was, the players? It was, but it, it was mixed Not up. Of course, you know, whenever you, you, you develop, let's say, the, the Burgundian fetish, uh, you know, your tastes towards to, like, just really be unilateral and all things Burgundy. So when I got back to Montreal and, you know, of course, that was like the dawn of, uh, you know, California wine perhaps was making a headway on wine lists in this city. Uh, you know, it was the dawn of uh, Australian wine and South African wine. You know, there's a whole bunch of things. I found it all very confusing. And I said, you know, I don't really see that. The food that I cook, you know, uh, it doesn't go with all these these wines, like I just rather like let's keep it close to the plate. Uh, you know, at that point, I was already quite educated just about small producer wine versus negos or, or larger producer wine. So I said, I'm a small restaurant working in small restaurants, and I kind of want to work with winemakers that I can get on the phone, you know, uh, like minded individuals. I run a small restaurant, I think. You know, I'm buying lobster from a small fisherman. I, I'd like this uh, Macon to be from a, a small family that have, uh, values somewhat like mine. Right, which is not typical of how big restaurants would do it. Um, so you come back from Burgundy and do you jump into the building of Joe Beef or a few things happen before? Oh, that? no. Yeah. I worked for a, a bigger rest. I worked first. I went to the West Coast. I learned a lot of stuff on the West Coast. I went to work at this restaurant called Sue Carver House. They would kind of hired me when I came back from Montreal with the skills that I had working in Burgundy. They were they, they kind of headhunted me and made me some kind of offer I couldn't refuse because I'd never had money thrown at me in my life. So I went out and worked at Sue Carver House, which is interesting, you know, kind of hippie kitchen, massive kitchen gardens, working really closely, locally, fierce local, uh, only the fish from that bay. No, you know, I think the two things that didn't come from a three kilometer radius of the restaurant were chocolate and oranges, orange for the inn, for orange juice, just because they figured that they couldn't run an inn without chocolate or oranges. But right. everything else was from like literally a five kilometer radius. 
And I learned an enormous amount of stuff from the, from, from, from the people who ran that in, you know, they were part of that kind of Pacific Northwest, uh, right. Big and not food a lot, scene at that time. Not a lot of people were doing it that way. Right. You know, where right. it was really low, like radius sourced farm to table. No, no one was doing it. You know, yeah. they, you know, they, they, I hadn't even really heard of Alice Waters back then, you know, and they were like big yeah. followers of Alice Waters. And then I discovered that there was this like wine scene on Vancouver Island of which they were really, you know, deep in. And then we discovered, of course, at that time, uh, the, the wines of Washington State. I remember like, you know, discovering Andrew Will's wines all, all you know, way back well, then. And Ken the, Wright. The big Cabernets. Knows. Yeah. Yeah. But they were really beautifully made wines yes. when my tastes were, when my tastes were, you know, were that way, you know, as I got older, my tastes have changed enormously. I, you know, I, I uh, it's a marathon for me today to drink a new oak Cabernet. Uh, you know, I just can't, my body can't handle it, right? So, uh, but back then, you know, th those Andrew Will wines, especially, I remember just being so incredible. Yeah, still are. <laughs> yeah, In no its doubt. Own way. All right, so you stay there how long, and then where do you go after you finish? A couple of years. Uh, I stayed there about a year. Uh, came back home. Uh, worked for a larger restaurant group called, you know, the Buonanotte Group. Kind of bigger restaurants, debaucherous, bottle service, 130 customers at 7 o'clock and another 130 at 9. Uh, but again, that, you know. Was that Globe and Royale? Correct. I was Globe. Yeah, I was Globe. Globe, and then right. Yeah. From Globe, I went Rosalie. on and opened. Rosalie. Rosalie, Rosalie not yeah. Right. But, you know, these were like bigger restaurants from a bigger restaurant group, uh, you know, and I was just like, like a really just a, an up and coming kind of chef. But, you know, with that volume, though, and the amount of people that we did in those restaurants, I got to know a lot about operating volume and, and knowing uh, really who who were the major customers in the city? I learned every, you know, I learned who everybody was. It was very important for me when I walked away from that restaurant group to open Joe Beef um, in the neighborhood that it's in back then. Like, you know, nobody would come down here unless you were trying to score a bag of cocaine. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, so for me to attract uh, the you know, the wealthy kind of customers that I've been accustomed to cooking for, you know, of course, like I like foie gras, truffles and Dover soles and expensive cuts of meat and things like that. So for me to be able to practice the things that I'd learned in my apprenticeship, I kind of needed some high wattage customers to be able to, you know, do what I, I want to do. And we were as well at that time, the canaries in the coal mine somehow, uh, if you look at the time and place of North American dining, uh, you know, when Fred and I opened Joe Beef, it was 25 seats and it wasn't a thing. Like, you know, every other restaurant in the city, a small restaurant was 100 seats. And then there was like two chefs running a 25 seat restaurant. And we're kind of the canaries in the coal mine for the uh, chef chef owned tiny restaurant where the customer is not always right. Right. It was really I serve at my pleasure, not at yours. Right. But so to that point, when you opened it up, did you have the concept clear in your mind? I mean, yeah, was it going to be did. a French bistro? Was it going to be a carryover from Burgundy, a little of the, you know, way West Coast? Y no, you know, we you sat out front and, you know, the neighborhood and the space and its proximity to their historical Atwater market dictated what this restaurant should be. You know, uh, as thinking men who, you know, Fred and I, who love antique stores, when we sat across the street, said that restaurant looks like it should have oysters. It looks like it should have steak. It looks like it should have lamb chops. It looks like it should have liver. It looks like La Louis. It looks like we should do chickens for four. It looks like it should have sweetbreads and cream, you know, and that's ultimately what we did. I played the music that I liked. I built, I bought the chairs that I, that I like. I play the music that I like and I made a wine list of the wines that I like. 
And it's not about anybody else. It's my private, it's mine and Fred's private personal space, right? Of, in, in which we cook the food that we like. Now, if you don't like it, you don't have to come. You know, that was always the mantra. It still is. You were, you were firm about that. It was sort of like F you, you know, this is what we do. You don't like it. Go somewhere else, you know. Yeah. But we, things- think, you know we, we have vodka. You better have it on ice. Because right. we don't make martinis right. and there's no cranberry juice here. and There never will be. So, you know, like that's tough beans. And ultimately, you know, I was even torn about the whole thing. I've never liked, uh, you know, hard alcohol. Uh, I like Calvados. It's about it. Right. And, you know, it took a long time for us to even, I said, I think just having w- champagne, white wine and red wine is enough. You know? Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about wine for a second. There's a lot of things I want to talk about, but let's stay on wine. Obviously, you made the connection with wine or really solidified when you were in Burgundy. What I'm curious about is, you know, what was that time or when did you, you know, discover natural wines? You know, the small grower, the farmer, you know, what you described before. Um, when did that happen? That's a great, we, there was an agency here called Rezin, R-E-Z-I-N, Jean-Philippe from Rezin. And, you know, you have to think of the time and place again. Like, it's, the world is completely Robert Parkerized. Oh, everybody's still lining up to buy Super Tuscans. Uh, everybody's looking for 94 point wines from California or Australia. It's a really different scene. And then- Big, I had big, this big friend, in ratings, right. Yeah. And then I have this friend, Jean-Philippe from Rezin, who is like, he was trying to sell us, you know, Morgon from Le Pierre. Uh, but, like, but back then, though, back then, yeah. when, like, when the half of them, you know, there was such a bottle variation. Some of, the, some of them were sparkling. Uh, the Chateau de Cambon, <laughs> like, we'd, oh, we'd pull the cork on Chateau de Cambon and half of the wine would come out. Uh, <laughs> it, it, he was just, like, trying to sell natural wine at its most natural during dip, like the, the darkest period in parkerization. But eventually we, we went for dinner one night at Au Pied de Cochon and uh, Marcel Lapierre was there. And I sat with, I sat with him and Martin and Jean-Philippe and other, you know, I think, was it Tevenet? I don't, I forget who was there, but somebody else was there. Another, another Burgundian, uh, Foyard, perhaps, I believe. And I got it. I just understood this. I said, listen, we're having fun, right? I was like, yeah, we're going to drink some wine, right? Yeah. I said, do you want to go the distance? I was like, yeah. I said, would you want to drink light wine? We're going to go the distance. And I understood this one thing, the pair said, it's not about anything, but, you know, buvabilité, drinkability, digest you know, I want to drink digestible wines. We can't always have sirloin st- short rib meat in red wine sauce with foie gras and caramelized onions. Sometimes you got to eat a fish with a salad, right? I like wine. I want to drink it every day. If you want to drink wine every day, you better make sure it's pretty pure. It's pretty light in alcohol. It's pretty hydrating. It's pretty, it's pretty clean, right? And then, of course, the parallels all fell into place. As we worked inside the restaurants and we got better at what we did, we tried to work closer with small farms to get better onions, better carrots, better garlic, better chickens, better cheese. And there was this, there, there was this cross flow day where it was just like, this wine list doesn't follow. And I, and I started noticing when I travel to New York, no disrespect again, again, which this is a long time ago. That no disrespect said, taken. Often that the wine lists didn't, there was a, there was a, there was a, 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 a disconnect between sometimes uh, a chef's cooking, some chefs are just doing some beautiful, beautiful, light-handed, just stellar cooking, right? Right. 
right. and then like the psalm seems to re- not be listening or not really understand right there's these disconnects between the menu and the wine list and then a further disconnect which i still complain about to this day it's like we've forgotten the era of the epic wine and food pairings it's something we don't talk about anymore even the young psalms or the 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 wine influencers of instagram you know promote yeah. a lot of natural wine but very uh, not often or ever talk about what you're supposed to drink with an orange macerated half sparkling you, amphora you, you're right wine it's just from a bottle the bottle shop yeah. right exactly right so what yeah. what does that wine go best with so you know as long as we made efforts to serve better food i just said i want the same efforts that we're making in the food I want I want the same kind of work to reflect in the wine list, uh, and so, if so be it. If so be it that we banished Cabernet Sauvignon from the wine list. So be it. You didn't care. You know, yeah, you didn't. I care. didn't care. I just said, just they said you realize that like the wine, like all the reds are Gamay. So you know, did at you, certain periods, and I was like, I don't care. David, did you did you sort of create? the hub for natural wine did it exist before in montreal or as you you know shifted that way because you well, got I hate it to and say, you want it wasn't just us you know there was like l'express is one of the oldest restaurants in sure. the city legendary and Lix, yeah yeah legendary restaurant and l'express always had and it still does you know one foot in uh intelligent classicist wines right and then but right. another foot like li, li, for 35 years there's always been la pierre at l'express right you know so they so they, they, they got us, it before anybody yeah before anybody you know we were all we we all stopped drinking you know new modern wines and just yeah. all went back to you know to l'express really and you know, drank tell- the Lapierres of this world, Lapierre and Friends. I always call it like the first wave of natural wine. Well, those the four guys in you know uh, Beaujolais, they were you know very influential. Um, tell me a couple things. Um, is that why you eventually opened Living Papillon? You know, to showcase wine even more. And didn't you get into the wine business? Are you still in the wine business? You know, as a business. Yeah, well, we invested. I invested a little bit early on in Vanya, who used to, we kind of built Vin Papillon, which is a wine bar that's focused mostly on small plates of vegetables. Because I had two masculine restaurants, Joe Beef and Liverpool House, and Vanya right. started taking more and more space inside the company. And, uh, you know, we just decided that it would be cool that we built a restaurant kind of around Vanya somewhat, right? And right. Uh, that's what we did. So that, that, that-, that was that thing, you know? That was a good yang, good yang to your yin. Yeah, and it's still cool. You know, Vanya's gone on her own way now to focus on her wine agency. And, uh, you know, we sold them uh, one of uh, another wine bar that we built called Vin Mon Lapin that she now runs with her husband. Right. Uh, that's, that's really cool. Um, yeah. All right, so I want to get into something with you because this is something you've been very close to and, you know, I think your perspective would be wonderful. You know, we know the restaurant business has a reputation for drugs and alcohol. Um, I mean, mostly the business side, even though, you know, the clientele partakes. Um, Something that affected you, um, you know, you got caught up in all of this. Um, and, and I read somewhere, I thought it was very good. You know, at some point you realize you had a drinking problem, but you kind of denied it by saying, well, I have a natural wine problem. <laughs> it's the best <laughs> you line, though. Yeah. I don't, which is pre- I'm not an which alcoholic. Is pre- I have yeah, a natural, I drink natural wine, wine. Yeah. I thought that was pretty clever, you know. So that that's a good segue to, I think, an important part, you know, of your life and how it's affected you, family, the restaurant and all that. Um you know, you, I'm going to be very uh, harsh and specific here. You were kind of a fat alcoholic with a, a, a an oversized love for food, wine, and people. I mean, that was your Absolutely. persona. You know, that was yeah. your persona. And, and you preached. You preached eating and drinking, you know, to excess, which was really the vibe of the place. So 
What I'm curious about is because that's not who you are. Just tell me a little, you know, what happened? You know, what was your realization that, holy shit, I can't do this anymore? You know, when was that? And, you know, walk me through a little of, you know, what you did. It's fairly well documented. But, you know, tell me about this. Yeah, well, I, you know, I got to a point where, you know, we were successful. The restaurants were always busy. Uh, I must have been teetering near about 380 pounds. Jeez. Uh, you know, I drank and ate to excess. I drank Magnums, you know, as of three o'clock in the afternoon. There wasn't any wine. I got to, a, a, they just bored. Got <laughs> bored of being unhealthy, bored of being fat. Bored about all the bad drunk conversations I've been having. Bored about being who I was. Um, but to, how many years was that? Was that 15, 20 years of the years. restaurant? Oh, listen, yeah. I think when they say you're an alcoholic, you're an alcoholic all your life. But uh, yeah. I think, you know, for me, it became problematic, uh, you know. Over, now, what did like, you do? Did you do it on your own or... Listen, I tried to stop drinking a couple of times or to diminish the amount of wine that I drank, but uh, I, you know, I failed continually. I'd string together five days, but then some some friend would show up in town, and I had to drink with them, of course. Right. 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 Or some winemaker had to show up, and he wanted me to taste all of his new Sancerres, so I had to do that. Right. So or there was the, always an the, excuse to jump off the wagon. Right. So, or the press would come, and you know, you'd want to impress them. But I got to a point where I was just miserable. And, you know, I think Vanya, Fred, uh, Ryan Gray, a couple of some of my close friends or, Matt, you know, people that were, I work here with in the restaurant just, you know, had an intervention with me. And they said, listen, you're not happy. We'd like you to be happy. Right. And I and said, you're 100 percent right. I'm so unhappy. But they said, you know, so you have three no, beautiful no, no daughters. Pushback. You have everything. You have, I, I said, thank you. When do I leave? And wow. the funny thing is, is I just went to a, a a rehab. There was no withdrawal or anything like that. I just had to be, you know. They said to me one very simple thing. They said, hey, David, if you got hit by a car tomorrow and uh, you died, would uh, the restaurants keep on going? And I go, yeah, they'd keep on going, but they'd be different. And the, the guy there at the rehab at Chatsworth, he said, so why are you, why are you killing yourself? I was like, meaning, right. M meaning you got everything to where you wanted it and yeah, you had cool. good people that can function with you or without you, he preferably said, Could you move you. to Costa Rica for a year and Joe Beef would keep on operating? I said, yes. So yep. why don't you? So this was when? This was, what, about th almost three years ago, right? I mean, this yeah, is yeah, a fairly current occurrence ago, in yeah. your life. Right. Yeah. And you shed a lot of weight, I guess, when you're not drinking that much and eating. Right. So you feel better, like you said. And you've yeah. stuck to the, you've stuck to the program. You, you still. Yeah, you watch for sure. It. The first year I was really, you know, like, uh, very, you know, terrified because it had so much to do. I felt with the business, who I was, what everybody was going to think about me the hypocrisy of me preaching all that stuff for years. I'll never be able to see my friends in New York City and Brooklyn and LA. I'll never be able to go to Burgundy again. Um, you know, it was just my life had ended. You know, it was like drinking wine with friends was such a, a massive part of who I was that now it was gone. And I just thought I was going to be alone in an apartment watching Netflix for the rest of my life, right? But I surrounded myself with uh, some, you know, some people that work in the business, like Ryan Gray from Elena. And, uh, and I, I started realizing that a lot of my friends drink wine responsibly. Right. And I was like, oh, I'm the, I, I didn't drink wine responsibly, but they do. Okay, I get was it. There, was there a consideration that maybe you could or was all in or all out? No, listen, I'm all out. Um, okay. I taste, uh, Every second day, if there's anything that I want to taste, I will taste, and I'll taste it a lot. <laughs> if you right. know, if, right. if 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 someone's opening a, a an old Auvergnat, uh, you know, you put two ounces off, yeah. in my glass, I'm not going to swallow it, but I'm going to taste it 55 right. times and spit it 55 times. Like I love right. viticulture, I love natural wine. 
I, I love selling wine. I love wine education. Uh, I just, you know. Yeah. I also love now, <laughs> sleeping really well. I love which, waking which up Which you do early. when you don't drink, right. Correct. I, right. I love waking up really early. I love never having a hangover. And listen, I just really love my life right now, right? I'm really happy, but wine is still a massive part of it. I talk about wine every day with Max Campbell, who buys the wines for the restaurants. I talk right. about wine with Vanya. I talk about wine. I still talk to winemakers. I look at wine posts. I follow the wine industry. Well, I taste it's, it's whatever big, I feel like. I just don't it's, swallow. It's a big part of you. Now, with all these changes that you made, obviously, everyone took notice before and after. Has it trickled down? You know, do people get it, respect you, follow you? You know, if he's not drinking, maybe I won't drink as much. I mean, does that oh, yeah, affect, Fred, you know, the people around the restaurant? Fred stopped drinking uh, pretty much like around six months right after I did because he saw that I was like having a good time. And then he wanted, me, you know, to get on board a little bit, maybe support me at first, kind of, but then realized that he was better off without it. So he's been sober for, I don't know, two and a half, three years almost. Uh, and generally the culture of the restaurant, listen, if the head Viking isn't drinking magnums on the bow of the boat, pretty much the other Vikings aren't drinking either. They're still... Uh, a discussion about wine in the restaurant. There's an excitement about purchasing wine. There's an excitement about knowing what the wine's all about and selling the wine. But there's just like, when we close the restaurants now, we just go home afterwards. Right, you're not hanging, pounding, you know. We're going no. across the street. Um, no. You know, an, an interesting thing recently happened. Um, which has some connection to what we're talking about. The quarter of master sommeliers in the U.S. got caught up in a pretty big sexual harassment scandal involving dozens of women. As a matter of fact, it's a cover story of the food section of the New York Times. And the court just, I, I don't think they fired, but they suspended, you know, a bunch of the psalms for all this harassment. Um, you know, and they could be looking at, the end of the organization or at least a major overhaul um you know and i'm not singling you out and i don't want to make you uncomfortable but you know your restaurants haven't been free of scandal which is you know not unusual um what i'm curious about because you have a perspective you know while you were drinking and now that you're not and i think culturally you're trying to you know change things all this harassment and, you know, the culture, you know, why does it happen? I always worry, you know, where's management when this uh, crap's uh, going on? And, and, had, and, you know, just give me some perspective on, you know, how can we change it a little? Well, 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 well first, you know, what, what happens happens in all businesses. Okay, it happens in the medical field. Right. It happens in lawyers' offices. But it throw happens a little at the alcohol in, it ain't helping. Correct. So our job, first and foremost, is to a, entertainment in the evening, right? Second of all, it's to feed you, but it's also to drink you. But let's not, let's cut to the, let's cut to the nitty gritty. Wine is a beverage made from grapes that contains alcohol, which is a drug. The end. And it's a drug that makes you uninhibited. So don't, don't look further for a room of educated wine experts to act poorly after they consume large amounts of a drug made from grapes. You know, give a, give a lawyer's cabinet in the privacy of their tower on the 52nd floor in Manhattan. The same setup. Uh, a Krug tasting of multiple vintages. I, I guarantee you some out of place comments or some odd behavior when you're consuming a drug made from alcohol. Okay. Uh, but that doesn't you know, make it okay. That's, that's it why doesn't it doesn't make happens. it okay. Absolutely. But don't that's, have to, you know, let's not ask ourselves like why it's happening. Right. So why is it happening? Because it's a bad combination. There's a, there's a giant responsibility that comes with the act of being able to sell alcohol, to serve alcohol, and to use alcohol. Look at this. I've lost 
I'm so like anybody listening to this that has not lost the privilege and the honor to enjoy wine tonight responsibly, I'm jealous of you. I, through my actions and through my excess, have lost the privilege to enjoy one of the things I love the most, wine. You see what I'm saying? It's not totally. To, it's not to be taken lightly, you know. It's a it's a, it's a very powerful drug. It's a toxic element for your body as well, right? And and and, and there's a there's a massive responsibility that comes with the promotion of it. Even today, I see on Instagram, there's like so many wine influencer kind of cool kid Instagram accounts always posting the next cool label pink wax dipped bottle and natty that you need right it's just, there's, just, there's, a, there's a part of irresponsibility that you know if you just replace that it's like it's, it's not alcohol it's like a bottle of really cool liquid cocaine it's a bottle of you know this these are these are real drugs it's but not a cool gives, object that you need wh- what gives a guy, you know, why is that an excuse? I mean, you explain what it is where he gets buzzed and he's around, you know, an environment with women, you know, at night and he could smack her butt or, you know, make a move no on excuse. her, no it, excuse. you know, so, yeah. so I guess, you know, I hate to say this, the combination is going to make it happen. It's really up to uh, the environment that you create and how you handle it. Now, absolutely, tell me this. I, I've created it. But my, tell me this, past. David. Yeah. Since you sort of changed your habits, and everybody notices that, um, have you changed the culture at the restaurant? Absolutely. You know, how? We, I was away from the restaurant for a large part of that. You know, for like the staff that worked in my restaurants that love being here, the people that work here for many years were well on their way of doing that with or without me, right? If anything, I came back later as a zero tolerance enforcer, you know? But while I was off walking around the wine bars of the city and being a cool chef with lots of friends around the city, Vanya's a responsible drinker. Uh, Max Campbell is a responsible drinker. James Simpkins was a responsible drinker. The people that ran Joe Beef night, day in, day out, were responsible people. Listen, so you, 150 you, you, employees. Absolutely, we've screwed right, up. You were the there. screw up. They took care of everything, you know, and you kind of used, you know, drinking in excess as an excuse but you wouldn't let that affect the culture, nor were you know the people running the place as involved in that as you were. Fair. Just because you're the owner of the restaurant or a chef doesn't mean that you're the king of the restaurant. There's not one person inside of these restaurants that does not feel absolutely comfortable about telling me, David, you're out of line. David, get out of here. David, that was stupid. David, I'll, like, like, you know. And I'm happy that we built that early on, that right. even Fred right is people. accountable, I was accountable to people who aren't my boss. Right. Um, David, we got to take a quick break. But before we take that break, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, I had Zev Rovine on a couple, Rovine on a couple weeks ago. You know Zev? I love Zev. He represents our wines in the, in, right. uh, in the USA. So he he's talking about a code of conduct in response to all of this stuff. And, you know, he's trying to build it inward, you know, where he'll do it for his company and that's the way they should act. But he's thinking about, you know, giving it to the industry and certainly, you know, where, where a lot of the abuse is in restaurants and all that. If somebody came up with a, uh, you know, a real and reasonable code of conduct is that something you would embrace or would you fluff it off and say, well, we sort Never of do it anyway? Year. I don't Why? decide these things. The group decides. We've decided that we want everybody that works here to be happy, to be safe, to have resources if they need them, whether it's a gambling addiction, a sex addiction, a drug addiction, an alcohol addiction, right? We've, de- we've decided that we were a family that run four restaurants and that we are our brother's keepers. 
So you will, you can create your own code of conduct, which is, you know, sort of personalized to your people and your needs. Fair? Yes. But okay. that said, to change the industry, okay, like what Zev is talking about, I can't say that everybody's going to break off into their own factions and do their own thing. That's sweeping it under the rug. If many people are doing it together, then it's, it's even better. It just creates more, it just, it, it, precipitates it right i agree with that um, listen everybody's on the natural wine uh caravan let's all be on the running ever. rest no but you know we're all, we're all on the natural wine caravan let's be all, all let's all be on the running safe kind friendly restaurants caravan well, it's funny you say that because I had I also had Krista Scruggs on about four or five weeks ago, and I asked her, you know, I was just curious of how she defined natural wines, and it's beyond regenerative farming and you know in the cellar and grapes, he, you know, her thing now is it's about the people, it's how you treat your people, and I think that's what you're saying too. So I think yeah, that's generally, an thing. you know, the restaurants that are serving, and I, I don't like the word natural. I like to say living wine. The restaurants that are serving living wine, generally. We're, it's like deadheads, like-minded individuals, you know. Like, they're saying, if I'm in San Francisco at a natural wine bar, I might run into the same people tomorrow in Paris. It's we, you know, we are everywhere kind of syndrome. All right, David, we got to take a quick break. I'm talking to David McMillan. David is the uh, proprietor of the Joe Beef restaurants up in Montreal, Liverpool House, Live in Papillon, McKiernan. Um, when we come back, I want to talk to David about life during the pandemic and a bunch of other things. You're listening to The Grape Nation. I'm Sam Ben Ruby. We're talking with David McMillan on the Heritage Radio Network. All of us at HRN have been keeping busy, despite working and recording from home. This fall, we're proud to announce new shows on the network that each bring important and enlightening stories to listeners around the world. While the world is in turmoil and the future of our country is uncertain, there are certain constants that help keep us going. For us, food and storytelling are essential. While we can't come together in person, food podcasts from HRN provide a virtual table we can all gather around. Bringing exceptional stories to your ears and keeping you informed on the ever-changing political and environmental issues of our time is integral to our mission. At a time when the world around us is rapidly changing, HRN is committed to being here for our listening community, and we need you to be here for us. Join our table and help ensure the future of food radio by becoming a member of HRN. Go to heritageradionetwork.org slash donate to make a contribution. Check out the latest additions to our lineup while you're there. You can see all of our series at heritageradionetwork.org slash new show. Okay, we're back. We're back with my guest, David McMillan. David's talking to us from his apartment above Joe Beef in Montreal. Um, can we talk a little about the pandemic? Because how has it not consumed everyone's life, you know, this past year? Um, you know, when you you know, the pandemic happened and, and we'll jump ahead a little, you know, when you thought things were maybe hopefully easing up, you get shut down just this past month in October, correct? Yeah, we've been shut down twice now and now we've just been shut down again, right? So are you, where, yeah. where are you now? Are you open or you're still shut down? We're shut down. We're shut down till uh, December 1st. And I figure that the numbers aren't getting uh, better really. So I seriously doubt we'll be open till after Christmas and even then we'll see. Uh, I'm not counting on it. I'm not planning on it. Right now I'm planning on living the way that we're living with a small core team that we are and just doing the best that we can, doing takeout. Hopefully we'll monetize some Christmas menus. 
hopefully we can sell a few bottles of wine out the door. But uh, we have very, very uh, low hopes and low aspirations. Now, which sucks. Now, without, you know, looking at your tax returns, none of my business, you've been a very successful group. Does that help you endure, you know, this extended, you know, pain and uncertainty? Not really, because, you know, as you become a successful group, your, your lifestyle, you know, is dictated upon that. You know, I'd much rather be my uh, 29-year-old self, uh, <laughs> my $600 car and my $900 a month apartment because my monthly pill, you know, my monthly pill is, uh, is a salty one, right? So right. 2020 is literally a no-income year. Uh, right. for, for, and you, for you, you said you said you have 150 employees, employees, you know, that's a lot of people and a lot of lives. You know, what are you doing? What did you have to do? Did you have to furlough? I mean, you know, how do you try to be human about all of this? I'd say everybody's gone except for our core management team. With the hopes chefs of and sous chefs. Well, oh, no, this is catastrophic. We, we're like literally rebuilding. When when I reopen, if, I, you know, we're reopening like it was 15 years ago. It's a totally, it's, you can't fall back to what you were. You Listen, have to. I might as well have gone, we're not bankrupt, but I might as well have gone bankrupt, right? I don't know where, I don't know where 80% of my staff is, right? The only people here are the managers, and the chefs and the sous chefs. And I don't even know where everybody else is. They're just gone. You know, we were 150 when we closed. And now I think, how many are we? 20? Plus. Barely. Maybe we're 20 now. And, uh, and then, to, you know, when we closed, we were firing like on all cylinders. Joe B, 15 years, like crack waiters crack wine list crack cooks in the kitchen like 15 years of pro Building that ball up. yeah and all gone it's like before i get back to this you have to understand that the smallest details about just getting back to making fries the way that we were making <laughs> fries when we closed <laughs> is going to be funny. months no but it's like like the sauce that the red wine sauce for the steak has to be like looked upon like for, like just like we reopened with right. different people it, that have never even made that sauce before. Right. People, right? regulars can't come back and say, this doesn't taste the same. It's all you got to hit moving, the mark. All of the moving parts, like those thousand moving parts that it takes to open a restaurant every night at five o'clock have literally all been obliterated the way the bartender makes that drink that you love i don't know where she is she's gone i don't know how yeah. she made it i have no clue where she moved to that's sad. Uh, uh, that's you sad. Know. Yeah. people have a perception here you know in the u.s that the government didn't do a great job handling the pandemic and totally ignored and you know i'm right in new york totally ignored the hospitality industry which you know has a deeper you know, web and tentacles than most people know. Um, do you do you have the same feeling? I mean, do you have frustration with the way the government's been handling it, or you think they've been doing an okay job and that's the circumstance? What's your thoughts? I can't. You know, say the government. I have to say has done uh, the federal government has done an exemplary job. We've been covered with a multiple amount of uh, commercial rent relief. Uh, since day one, okay? We've, we've had all kinds of different uh, salary subsidies uh, since day one. Uh, even the furloughed staff has been taken care of uh, since day one. Honestly, the only problem that we've had has been more or less about our provincial government, the government of Quebec, uh, giving us hard data about why restaurants are closed because restaurants have been closed now for a month and a half and the numbers aren't going down. So maybe it's not the restaurants, maybe it's the supermarket, maybe it's right. the mall, maybe it's, it's the point, schools. David. Yeah, let us open up the restaurants again, right? 
And even then, we, now we have plexiglass dividers. Let us open the restaurants at one third capacity. I can make it with uh, I can I can I can make it doing twenty five people a night, right? But you can't shut us down completely because I can't pay my my gas. I can't pay my electricity. You know, but show us the data. So you're saying that you're at the very least closed down through the holidays. And then it's a wait see to see what happens then, correct? Yeah, but you know the nature of uh, you know well New York is somewhat like us, but I think we we have it worse here. The nature of dining in Quebec in uh, January and February, it, it's it's very cold. There's a lot of snow. yeah. I was going to say even New <laughs> York is screwed this time of the year. You're dead in the water. Yeah, you know, with any so, of those know, to, options. To, to jam yeah. 30 people inside of a small dining room of an old building, uh, you know, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense uh, right now so for how, us. How, how, you know, you're very telling in saying that, you know, when things come back, staff is gone, all, all everything that you built up is gone. You know, when... When are things going to get back to normal and or any sense of normal? And will they? I mean, do you have the only any hope, hope of- that I have, to be honest, do you want to get back to normal life first? Like I've, I've tried to I've shaken everybody's hand and kissed like as many. We're in Quebec here. We kiss both cheeks. Right. When I work a shift, I kiss a hundred people, men and women. Right. Right. Uh, <laughs> No, but for real, it's just this is no. I, I hug, know. I, that, I hug all that, my customers when they come in. When they rep- leave, I kiss. That's your reputation. So I don't know. You know, before yeah. the only option is like a full blown vaccine that works really, really, really well. Otherwise, this is the end of dining as you know it. Well, it's funny you say really, really well on the vaccine because a couple things. Not everyone takes it, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. So you got that. And the effective rate, you know, a lot of times is 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. So even in the best efforts, you know, you're not covering everyone. But I think it eases people, you know, emotionally. Um, I know that for years you've had a a getaway like by the Vermont border. Because of all of this, have you been spending, you know, more time away from the restaurant with the kids? Yeah, I have asthma. Uh, So I was told by my doctors that, you know, David, uh, COVID, it it is what it is. But they said with your with your asthma, like you don't want it. Yeah. So you have to make as well an extra effort to stay away from people more than the average. So uh, we planted a vineyard. <laughs> we planted at, 10, the, at your farm, Saint Armand, right on the border of the what, right on the border of Vermont. Yeah. What kind of grapes? So we planted about two acres in uh, hybrids. Wow. So it's like Saint Pepin, Tasca, a couple of Swenson things, and then we Neat. planted another few acres in vinifera. Of course, we hill it up, and we'll be putting geotextiles on next year. So we planted wow. about eight, eight, eight. Eight acres. Wow, you really far. got it going there. So we're, we're, is it going to take, you know, three, four, five years until you pr- pull fruit that you could do anything with or sooner? No, we'll make wine after, not next not next year, but the year after. And I guess okay. we'll make a lot of wine in 2024. That'd be great. Um, I want to check back with you on that. Um, David, we do a thing on the show. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, it's called the wine list. And I ask all my guests the same five questions about their wine preferences. And I know you're not drinking, but you admitted that you're tasting and you still have, uh, uh, in your mind, a body of a lot of wines that you tasted. Um, but before I ask you that, I wanted to ask you one more question. You know, we talked about you, your reputation, the restaurant and all that. I'm just curious when you look back, do you think you and the restaurant would have succeeded if you didn't take on like that big Viking, you know, eating and drinking persona? I mean, was the business built around that, um, you know, where you connected with where you connected with people and, you, you know, just had a great time and people came for that? Would it be the same? You know, I had role models uh, in the restaurant business. You know, Bertrand from Paul Bear is still alive and still holds court at Paul Bear every night in Paris. 
Uh, uh, you know, I love, I, I just, you know, I fell in love with larger of larger than life bistro owners. I was never uh, a lover of high end dining or Michelin star dining. I always loved the pate, Lyonnais, Bouchon, like let's drink magnums of, you know, I fell in love with like a persona, right? And I wanted my restaurants to be somewhere where you that are festive, right? So the answer is yes. You know, that's what you wanted. That's who you are. And that's, you know, sort of how you that's made it. your claim to fame. Would I, would I have done things different? Yes. Do I yeah, wish? Yeah, but everybody do- would. You know, you don't get a yeah. do-over. Well, we came but- from such like, you know, one day on a sidebar. You have no, you know, when people talk about today, the abuse that they they went through in a restaurant and I give it, it's all bad, right? But if I told you what I went through in my apprenticeship, you, you wouldn't even believe the half of it. Like I've been beaten up so many times. I've got cigarettes put out on me. Uh, like, you know, I, I, I had, a, I had a, a horrific, traumatic apprenticeship and I've worked for monsters, Right. Well, I I hope there's less of that going on, but I'm afraid it's still going on a little. And we'll leave it at that. All right, David, let's do this wine list. I'm going to ask you five questions. They're spontaneous. You don't know them. Like I said, I ask all my guests the same five questions. I post everything on social media um, because my listeners love to hear, you know, what guys like you and all my other guests are drinking and everything. Um, So don't don't fixate or dwell over these so the first question is and keep in mind you know sobriety but your body of knowledge in the restaurant and all that um what are you drinking now you're what are you tasting now is it a seasonal change thing is there a region that's hot to you you know what's in the fridge who's showing up at the restaurant you know you know there's what the one wine in particular that whenever i see is floating around the restaurant and if there's any of it open i gravitate to or I'll bug the sommelier to open one so I could taste Go it. Ahead. Is the wines of Julien Meyer? Uh, M A Y E R. M M E Y E R. From where? From Alsace. Okay, so that's that's a great beautiful, answer. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful macerations, beautiful skin contact Pinot Gris, crystalline whites, just stellar, stellar, stellar wines. Julien Meyer. M E Y E R. All right, I'm going to post that. I think Alsace is coming around, but definitely underrated. All right, second question, and you t- we talked about it earlier, so now you get your shot at it. Um, David McMillan's favorite wine and food pairing. Oh, uh, I'm a sucker for snails and garlic butter. Like I love snails and garlic butter. Oh, but yes. I would say, you know, Burg- Burgundy is breaking my heart these days too much of the same thing and nothing so exciting. Like I don't run when, when I see the burgundies being open anymore, like I did. Right. But, uh, any of the wines from, uh, Ganva or La Bay with snails, certainly Chardonnay's right, so or dry Ganva, Sauvignon's. Who was the second one? La Bay, L-A-B-E-T. Same village La next door. Yeah. Okay. So a Ganva and a La Bay with snails and garlic butter. That's a great. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, you probably can answer this. Um, your favorite wine restaurant and or bar. Now, I would say that a Joe Beef and a Le Vin de Papillon would fall into that because of the environment, the vibe, you know, the knowledge. You talked about education, you know, the wine list and all of that. When you look beyond your places, you know, there are a couple of places that are doing it well, whether it's in your travels, New York, Montreal, down the block, whatever. There's one place that I'm haunted by, right? That- what is it? That I wake up in the middle of the night with goosebumps and every, especially now during confinement and COVID, I would love so like anything. I would do anything to to wake up tomorrow and to be walking to La Cave Septime in Paris. In in Paris. Yeah. Yep. To, to be I've able to there. go to La Cave Septime at three o'clock tomorrow evening to sit on a wooden crate and have a cheese plate and have those girls bring whatever they like is just 
yeah, yeah, like I get goosebumps thinking about it. That's, you know, and then there's That's their a- other restaurant across the street, the seafood place that they have, Clamato. Yeah, I love that right. place. It's, too. it's just that little corner, that little corner of Paris is a corner of joy. Very cool. You know what's very sad? You dream about it. The people that are living there can't even go. They had to hightail their ass out of the city. So, I mean, the whole world is suffering the same thing. All right, fourth question. The question is, favorite all-time wine? Now, I am very redundant because I say this during every show. I originally put the question together asking a guy like you, what is the most expensive rare wine you ever tasted? I don't care about that anymore. What I care about is what's that wine that is or was so important to you that changed things, you know, that still resonates with you? Can you put your finger on that wine? Duray. Any wines from Duray. Really? Why? Yeah. Just quintessential, perfect, like natural, real burgundy, true farming. Uh, I've never had a bottle that's not spectacular. Uh, Spell for I me. don't know. It just feels like the true essence of burgundy for me, those Durain wines. How do you spell Durain? D-E-R-A-I-N. Durain. That's what I thought I wanted to check. Um and you felt this way? I, I mean, uh, the Duranes have just been a, an important wine to you, you know. It's, it's just I can't thing. imagine running a restaurant without, like, like let's say, like a quarter of the white burgundies on the wine list being from Durain. It's just kind of the yeah. salinity, the the slow hand at the wood, the just the length of the wines, and maybe the the, the humility of them. And I know I'm getting yeah. into those words, but. It's just, no, no, it's no, no, all... no, 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 no. That, that's what I'm looking for. I mean, you got And some of my if... friends would say you're crazy. You're wrong. Who cares? You know, they're like, what's with you and Durang? <laughs> and I'll be like, that's I don't know. It's just, that's what that is. All right. I love that answer. All right. Here's the last question. And I think because you've been in the business long enough and because of the Papillon and you've been around, um, I want you to recommend to me the best wine around 15, 20, 22 bucks, a red and a white wine. wine. Under 15 bucks? No, 15 to 20 bucks. But here's the setup. I got kids in my 20s, in their 20s. You know, they can't go to parties now and bring supermarket crap wine. Um, They can't give a gift of a wine like that. But, you know, they also can't afford to, you know, buy $40 bottles of wine. So give me a red and a white, you know, in the 15, 20. You remember before we were talking about those, like, legends of Beaujolais, La Pierre. Yes. Foyard. But you remember, yeah. of course, in, in, in that group of, of guys, it was Decombe. That's, he, he's on the uh, lower price of those guys? Cause no, you know no, but sucks? his son, his son, his son, KK, K-E-K-E, KK Decombe, was like, like the son of a giant Beaujolais original So he's wine making maker. something? He's making absolutely a wonderful range of lower priced wines under twenty bucks. Perfect. That are that are that's just that's a real and He's fine. in for the long. He's he's gonna be he's gonna be around for a long time. So so you know. Yeah, nobody has ever uh, brought him up before. Now, what about a white? The uh, the wines of the Cornet family in the Maconnet. Who okay. if we say so? Yeah, C O R N I N. Cornet. Okay. Yeah, but I want to tell and, you a and, fast one. Go ahead. I want to talk about a Maison Ménad. M A E N A D. M A E M A E N A D. Yeah, check it Menad. out on Instagram at Maison Ménad. This is a and Canadian what are they girl. Making? This is a okay. Canadian girl that works at Ganva. She's been there for four vintages, and she just started making some of her own wines. So she is a Canadian girl working in Orbania, next apprenticing under Ganva, and now she's just starting to release some uh, of of her first wines from ancient vines and mixes of hybrids and lost Jura varietals that are even wow. I don't even believe are even illegal anymore. But anyway, <laughs> she's someone to watch very carefully. Some of those wines will be appearing. Uh, I believe through Zevro Vine and here in Montreal in the very near future. 
uh, Maison Menad is like a, it's this labor of love, beautiful story to watch. So like I said, I'm going to post everything. So I'm going to post that because those are the type of recommendations and tips, you know, that I love getting from my guests. And that's about as deep and as cool as you can go. So like I said, I'm going to post that. You did a wonderful job with the wine list and not to be repetitious, I will post everything. David, I told you the hour would go quickly. We got to wrap up. I just got to do a little show wrap up and then I want to get a little info from you and we're out of here. So if you have a question, suggestion, wine happening or event, hit me up at sam at thegrapenation.com. That's sam at thegrapenation.com. Please subscribe to the Grape Nation podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify or wherever you get your pods follow us on facebook at the grape nation on instagram we use s ben ruby my name on twitter we use just ben ruby we know that's confusing but you can always use the hashtag the grape nation like i said we'll post david's wine list on all our social media sites some really good recommendations there david if people's interests have been piqued and they want to get more information about you and the restaurants where do we find you in the restaurants on social media or on the internet tell me the best at joe beef at joe beef on instagram okay uh, at joe beef mtl on twitter okay and you can email the restaurant if you need anything we 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 still answer our emails by hand (laughs) okay all right i'm glad to hear that and unfortunately you probably have a little more time on your hand than you may want david i can't thank you enough i thought it was a great time to reach out to you with the pandemic with your life change and everything going on I only wish, you know, that you can endure this and, you know, get back to where you were and continued success. So good luck with everything. Thank you to our guest, David McMillan from uh, Joe Beef in, uh, in Montreal. Thanks to our engineer, Amanda, and everyone at the Heritage Radio Network. I'm Sam Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to The Grape Nation. The Grape Nation is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritageradionetwork. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. And thanks for listening.